I'll be asking uh, questions uh, regarding different technologies. It's uh, okay if you don't uh, don't have experience with anything. You just go on to move on to something else. Mm -hmm. um, but first, can you describe to me your latest experience for last year or couple of years? Yeah, sure, sure. So my name is Omkar and recently worked with the BNY Mellon as a senior application support and DevOps engineer. So as a part of the technology and tools, I work mostly in the AWS cloud. Then as a repository, I use the Git and also use the CI CD as a pipeline from the GitLab itself to do the automation of that pipeline. Then also use the mm -hmm. Docker. Then for the infrastructure automation, use the Terraform and uh, also use the Ansible jobs for creation of some jobs and Jenkins as a creation of the, some Jenkins pipeline. So based on that, uh, we are the different different project like we need to move the projects from on premises to the cloud. So we use the AWS as a cloud partner and with that we implemented from the scratch. And then we also need to implement for some of the project with the GitLab CI CD implementation. So that is also done. And apart from that, we also use the different different AWS services and initially we work in the AWS console to implement the services then later also working with the Terraform to fast that process so likewise I'm working okay thanks uh, so what what uh, services of AWS let's start with AWS uh, cloud uh, which services have yeah, you been so using I can say for the AWS EC2 RDS DynamoDB has been used then Lambda is also used and whatever uh, requirements like uh, uh, Route 53, then uh, security groups, then VPC, so that kind of also used. So whenever we need to do any project migration, we need to thought of uh, at least VPC, then Route 53, and based on that, whatever EC2 instances like load balance and other things that we need to combine and merge, then connection, security group, so that kind of we used. Mm -hmm. What if we need to connect to different VPCs? Uh, what options do we have? So what happens uh, uh, in a project, uh, what we do, so we have the EC2 instance, multiple EC2 instances, and we created the one VPC for that uh, EC2 and another VPC for the DB. So for that, we need to connect uh, connectivity. And uh, with that, whenever we need to make any call, so through that VPC, we need to call that particular. And uh, we also uh, use that AWS as a Lambda. So for the, uh, we can say interaction or event passing. So based on that, if you need to update or change anything, then we can do that. Okay. Um, what type of uh, even you working with S three S three storage as well? Yeah, yeah. So yes, three so. storage also use and event. If you talk, so what happens? Uh, we also use the log events like uh, we can say uh, we created the cloud uh, watch or we can say alarms. So based on that alarms, we never need uh, like if there is EC2 instance has been down or CPU utilization is threshold like 80% or above, then we need to trigger the events and that event will be sent over the email to the support team to take the next reaction. And as part of that load balancer, we have the multiple EC2 instance and we also setting limit like if uh, minimum will be one will be always active and maximum will be two and four based on that project and if their load is increased uh, most of the time over the month and load has been increased so we are using load balancer to increase the uh, number of servers and then decrease again all right um what type of uh, say storage uh, do you know that, that, that is there uh, so uh, not as much, but uh, mostly as a default uh, AWS provider is the storage that we use. Uh, so don't uh, go in deeper into types. And how how, how can we restrict uh, access to S3 buckets? So we have oh, the, grant, grant access or yeah, so we have the roles that has been defined. So normally whenever we are creating any service, we need to create the role to provide the particular access and we can restrict and only that particular user with that particular permission to read, write or other permission that we need to provide that role and that role can be assigned to that particular service. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, have you been have you been using auto scaling for yeah. EC2? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, uh, what rules can uh, we use to um, set on auto scaling group to, so, to, to monitor? 
yeah so for the auto scaling we need some uh, first of all uh, read and write permission for that particular EC2 instance and uh, also there is uh, like storage capacity like uh, whatever CPU utilization so uh, full access given for that particular uh, server like if that uh, event will be triggered then we need to increase so uh, we need to give full permission for that particular server to up and run yeah, but uh, based on what uh, automatic scaling can happen, uh, what rules can we achieve? Uh, yeah, so for that uh, we are using the CPU uh, uh, utilization. So if a threshold limit mm -hmm. has been set like 80%, then it will uh, create the another insert and it will up. And we, we are also giving some time limit like 300 milliseconds, like it will wait for the 300 milliseconds. If uh, still that uh, need to be activated, then it will up and running. Okay. Uh, do you know is it possible to schedule to, uh, to say something else? Uh, uh, no. Based on based on some other. Okay. okay. Hmm. Well, we can just uh, use some time schedule or some other metrics. But yeah, the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, uh, one moment. Uh, do you know what is the difference between uh, security group and network ACL? So I can say security group is more level at the granular level to that uh, service that we are defining, but network is at the at the top level. So whenever any request has been come to that particular application, it will goes to that uh, network security, and then it will come inside that VPC, and inside that we have the multiple security group. Okay, but what kind of rules can we set on network ACL level? Yeah, we can say like uh, we can allow the all the traffic like if it is the internet, so we are allowing the all the traffic like uh, yeah, HTTP port has been enabled, so all the traffic will be allowed. And uh, if there is a login functionality, then we need to specify like only particular uh, if that is a HTTPS service, then that port should be enabled and that only allowed. Okay, yeah, thanks. All right. Um... Uh, okay, let's move on to Terraform. Mm -hmm. uh, can, can you briefly describe what you've been doing with Terraform? Yeah, so for the Terraform, uh, we need to do infrastructure automation uh, using AWS. So whatever services that we are defining in the console, so we need to write uh, using that, uh, we can say infrastructure as a code, like EC2 and other things. So uh, first we need to pro uh, provide the, yeah, we need to use the providers to which provider so currently we are using the AWS provider then we need to provide the profile uh, profile pa we need to pass the profile as we don't need to pass directly hard coded uh, secret in other thing so based on the profile it will going to log into that uh, particular AWS and then uh, once we get inside that AWS then we need to create the resources like whatever resource like EC2 instance and then any other DB or uh, other things so likewise we need to create and in that we have a project like we need to define the variable as a separate uh, TF file and then we need to access based on the requirements and uh, other storage that we are defining. Like EC2 mm -hmm. instance, we create a separate TF file, likewise. Mm -hmm. Do you know how Terraform builds a dependency graph uh, based on what? Like uh, when we create, uh, let's say, VPC EC2 instance, how does uh, Terraform know uh, what should it be, what should go, what should be deployed first and what's after that? Yeah, actually what happens in the Terraform, whatever we define, it will uh, took as a uh, line by line. So whatever defined at the top, first will it, it will check. Like suppose if we uh, defining the one EC2 instance and also define the VPC cloud. So we need to give the reference of that particular uh, VPC to that particular EC2 instance, then it will check and it first will create the VPC and then it will bind to that EC2 instance once it has been created. All right. Uh, uh, can you tell me the difference between for each and account so for each uh, we can say it will loop uh, through that particular data whatever we're passing but uh, for the count it we just counter we can say it will be incremented so what the data type does uh, for each accepts uh, for each i think uh, yeah uh, for each we can say uh, numbers that can be accepted that will be considered in a yeah. range and that, that's probably count, uh, but what, what uh, for each, what kind of uh, data can be, type of data? Uh, so we can say... Uh, type of variables. Uh, 
yeah yeah so we can say that uh, numbers or other uh, whatever variable that we are pa passing like a string also that we can able to pass and we can distinguish based on that uh, loop mm -hmm. and how can we reference uh, uh, particular uh, instance of that for each uh, resource the, uh, we have a resource that has a for each in it how can we reference to a single instance of that resource okay so we, we have the resource and we have that particular ids has been defined for each resource so we need to reference using that id okay but in, for, in case of for each it's uh, uh, we use name not uh, like not id count count, count is using uh, oh, okay. id hmm. all right um and uh, how does Terraform know when we ch change some resource, uh, like increase memory, for example, or something else? How does Terraform know when we want to uh, recreate resource uh, completely or it can modify uh, it? Yeah, so what happens, uh, we, we have the multiple uh, steps in the Terraform init, plan, apply. So in that, whenever any changes has been happened, so Terraform is maintaining the state file. So based on that state file, it notes like particular resource has been updated and we need to take the fresh copy and we need to build again. So if uh, uh, if you consider one example, like uh, we are updating the resource related information in the AWS, so it will try to check if that state file al already contains the information for that. If not, then it will try to initialize that uh, infrastructure as a fresh and it will do. And next time we need to plan, then it will check like already we have that plan so we can proceed. Yeah, but uh, how does it decide whether it needs to completely destroy and create a new resource or it can modify it, uh, existing resource? Yeah, so if, if you it, want to change something. Yeah, so if it is destroyed, it will create a fresh copy. But how does it decide? So what's yeah, it, so what it, it's the, based on the uh, TF state file, I can say. TF state file is uh, managing all the things. Well, it's uh, rather on a provider settings, uh, what's on a, mm. was described in a provider. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and what are like what are recommendations to store uh, Terraform state file? So we can use uh, repositories for storing, and that should be uh, given the additional permission, like roles for that particular one. So it can be accessed uh, by the minimum users, and we don't need to change frequently. How can we avoid uh, like m multiple developers running uh, Terraform uh, pipeline at the same time? Like, how can we avoid it? Actually, what happens uh, when we are running the Terraform pipeline? So it initially directly create the lock. So whenever anyone try to do to changes for the same at the same time, then it will check that is already locked. You cannot perform the operation. So in that case, and other one, if you uh, you are using the pipeline, so we have the branching structure that has been defined like pro dev production UAT, and based on that, each individual user can create the pipeline uh, branch, and that can work. Okay. Thanks. Okay, all right. Um, let's talk about Docker. Mm -hmm. um, have you been writing Docker files? Yeah, so normally we are using for the Docker, like creating the Docker file and implement and create the container and run it. Do you know what's the difference between add or and copy commands? Uh, which one? Copy and? And uh, add and copy. Copy, yeah. So uh, if you want to copy one particular file or folder for another, then we can use the copy command. What about add? Uh, cat, cat, we can say is the Linux based command. So it's, it's like we can say. No, I mean, a, a, -G -G, a -G -G. Okay, yeah. We can say it's like uh, just check that particular file is present or not. And based on that, it will uh, do the modification or we can say copy. Um, and uh, what's the uh, uh, usually when we write Docker files? When you, uh, like, what's the best uh, practices when you write Docker files? Can you name some? So best practice we can say so whenever we want to work with like uh, any container like suppose if uh, Windows Linux and so we need to get the particular image like specific like if it is working with the nginx related application we need to use the nginx related uh, image from the Docker Hub itself first then we need to check 
our all uh, dependence has been already present like while, while fetching the image then we start building the environment and after building uh, whatever command that we are supposed to link like uh, we knew the batch com uh, command or anything then it will evaluate like whatever things as a prior to run that particular plane is present or not so we can uh, write down that docker file based on that data what about uh, uh, layers can you Mm, name some basic uh, principles, uh, best practices for, for for layers in Docker file. Layers, uh, no, 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 I don't comment on there. Don't have idea. Okay, and does uh, all all the Docker file commands uh, create a new layer? The like do you understand the principle? How does uh, layers in, the, in, in Docker work? Layers, I don't uh, understand, but uh, I can explain about the Docker file. So what happens uh, mm -hmm. whenever we uh, define in Docker file? So with the Docker command, we can able to build and run. So what happens uh, if you create the build command? Then we need to assign tag like create the image name name of the image we need to queue and once that has been triggered it will check line by line so first it will check from the which mm -hmm. image we need to fetch the data and after fetching the data what operation we need to perform like suppose as it is a small container it has limited library that has been already inbuilt so it easy to run and uh, like suppose if we consider about the batch application that we just need to use like cmd and run so we just need to write simple command and we can just return the data and once build has been ready it will check and we can check the uh, image has been created or not and once image has been ready then we can run it and it will create as a container so we can use that container yeah okay um do you know any security principles uh, when writing um, like security or regarding security best practices on docker file can you name some security no actually as a security part no no not worked you uh, you don't have experience running some security scans on Docker containers? Uh, no, no. Security related, actually, I don't have worked on that. Okay. Do you know what the... Uh... Okay, all right. Uh... Okay, let's move on. So you mentioned you've been using Jenkins, right? Yes. Uh, how, how do you create uh, pipelines? Yeah so, in the, yeah, so in the Jenkins, what happens, uh, we use in the collaboration with the GitLab. So we need to pass a connection uh, between the GitLab and Jenkins. And in the Jenkins, we need to create the CI CD pipeline. So whenever like a uh, build has been triggered, then we are uh, passing the event to the Jenkins and Jenkins going to trigger and it will do the automation or that. Uh, what kind of builds uh, you rank? Yeah, so in the in the GitLab side, we are using the MS build for building that particular application. So once build has been ready, then it will pass and it will trigger the event to the Jenkins side. And from the Jenkins, it will start building. And what exactly does Jenkins do? So we can, I can say it's like um, uh, pipeline related build where whatever build has been uh, created it should be ready and uh, ready for the deployment so it will check whatever test related parts and other things and based on that it will create uh, one package and that can be ready for the deployment and uh, how, how are you triggering uh, Terraform deployment what are you using mm, Terraform deployment so uh, how do you run uh, Terraform to, to apply inf infrastructure? Uh, yeah, so what happens here, we have a, a, a single project that contains the connectivity, the Git, then Terraform and AWS. And whatever information written inside the Terraform, that will first connect to the AWS. And with the Git, uh, so wh while we are make, making the changes, we just need to create the pull request or we can say change request. So with that, it will going to commit the changes to the Git and simultaneously it will trigger the pipeline and it will also connect with the AWS. Okay, so it uh, triggers the pipeline. So this pipeline is uh, running where? Uh, yeah, in the git, it... git itself, yeah. And uh, how do we, um, do you write pipe pipelines yourself? Uh, I can say 50% I work in the pipeline uh, as a part of um, git uh, CI CD implementation. 
um, can you describe uh, how you uh, what uh, pipeline mm -hmm. okay so in the okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah how it works yeah, so in the GitLab, what happens? We have the GitLab-CI YAML file. That is a root. So we need to keep it in the root folder. So when we define that Git YAML file, then it will check that pipeline is ready that we need to create. Okay, then in that we need to define the number of stages, like whatever stages that we need, like build, test, then we need to deploy so that stages we need to define and whatever dependency that we need to pass that we need to include like as a git is already providing the one ready template with it contain the all the basic information that is required to create and build the pipeline so that uh, with that template it will ready to test the pipeline okay and if that if there is any test framework that we need to add like sonar cube or anything and uh, we also do the artifactory deployment so artifactory deployment related path we also provided so once pipeline has been built and trigger so it will create the zip or we can say package and that has been deployed to the artifactory. All right, thanks. Mm. Okay. Um, some questions about Git. Uh, uh, can you describe the difference between uh, merge and rebase? Uh, batch and? Merge and rebase. Rebase. So, so what happens uh, with the rebase? If you want, uh, if you are working on the some uh, code changes and we need to rebase that particular branch, then we need to use git rebase command. So, whatever changes that can be, we can say temporary halted, and the uh, it will go to the uh, we can say parent of that particular branch, like commit ID. And with that, we need to work again on that uh, if any new changes that we need to work. And parallelly, if once change has been done, we can use it, use again that uh, previously stored rebase data. All right, and what is cherry pick? Cherry pick. So if you if you have the uh, multiple commits in that particular branch, and if you want to pick that particular commit, then based on that commit ID, we can pick and we can work from that only. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, you haven't mentioned Kubernetes. You, are, have, you don't have experience with Kubernetes. Yeah, actually just started to learn because don't have hands-on experience, but started to learn Kubernetes and started to learn on EKS as well, but uh, don't have as a practical experience. All right. Um, can you name... Okay, I was, uh, should I ask a couple of questions or you want to skip it? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, can you name what the kind of services uh, there is in Kubernetes? Yeah, so I can say, uh, we can say infrastructure that is related means whatever, uh, if you create one container with a Docker and uh, if we uh, compare the Docker swarm with the Kubernetes, then cluster based or orchestration that can be, has been done with the Kubernetes. So initially what happens with the Kubernetes environment, there are the uh, pods are there. So whatever container that has been defined, it will create one unique environment for that particular pod. And as number containers are growing, then that can be stored in the pool of Pods. So whatever information or whatever data has been present, it will be considered as a group of the pods and based on that Kubernetes will work. And parallelly uh, with AWS EKS cluster that has been used. So whatever configuration change has been doing with the manually with the Kubernetes, it is give plus point on the AWS EKS. With that, we can graphically uh, connect with a Kubernetes cluster and we need to provide the information and it will automatically create one cluster and pods and that we can able to connect. Okay. Uh, do you know what's the difference between uh, deployment and uh, stateful set? Deployment and? Stateful set. Stateful set. No, staple set, uh, don't remember, but deployment, if I, if I say uh, whatever changes that has been ready uh, for the production deployment, then that can be created as a package and that has been deployed to the production. Okay. If we uh, like, if you if you talk about uh, the cloud, uh, Kubernetes and the cloud, uh, and you have some ap application running in a, in a pod, how how can we make it uh, make it available to the internet uh, so that you can connect it to some 
Oh, okay. How can we make uh, some website avail uh, Kubernetes website to make available mm. on internet? No, no, don't remember. But I think there is some mm -hmm. uh, service or tool uh, inside the Kubernetes with, with that we can expose that particular URL over the internet. But uh, don't remember that service or tool name. Mm -hmm. In Ingress. Ingress, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. Have you been uh, working with databases? Uh, no much, cause uh, we just need to use whatever existing that is present mostly with the SQL DB, but uh, don't work hands on in that SQL. Uh, what kind of SQL DB? I can say MySQL and SQL Studio. So most of one, uh, whatever DBs are there, we just need to look with the SQL Management Studio, and we just need to take and work some basic queries. Mm -hmm. And you don't like. Well, if you if you need some, to change the, something uh, uh, during deployment, you need to change some table. You haven't done it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, simple like a uh, simple instant update delete that command has been worked, but uh, not in the full like a uh, store procedure updation that has not worked. Okay. Mm -hmm. See. Um, they have experience in uh, scripting languages. Um, yeah, yeah. So I work uh, in previously uh, Python and uh, some basic experience in the Bash. So not work means uh, current in the recently project, but I have experience, and if required, we can learn. Um, well, some questions about Bash. Uh, if you have uh, a Bash script uh, with multiple commands and uh, one of them gave error. How will script uh, work? What would happen? Yeah, so actually what happens in the bash script, yes. uh, uh, there are line by line command it is going to execute. If one uh, command will be failed, then it will break the particular statement and it will halt. So we need to at least uh, fix that one and then it will work next. Um, no, actually it's... Uh... By, the, by default, it will go to the end. It will pass an error, but it will go uh, to the end. Okay. Um, and what kind of experience with Python? Have you used uh, some external libraries? No, I can say uh, for the AWS Lambda, I use the Boto3 uh, that for uh, defining the handlers and pass uh, and work on that AWS Lambda. And okay, what kind of uh, what Lamb Lambda did? Yeah, so what happens in the Lambda? So if you want to connect or execute some additional functionality, whatever that particular things has happened in the AWS, like uh, we did like uh, if EC2 has been down, then we triggering the AWS, uh, EC2 uh, AWS Lambda and inside that we return the function and we need to import the Boto3 library and we need to connect that EC2 instance, like that instance has been down, then we need to trigger the Lambda and uh, with that we need to uh, call the uh, CloudWatch alarm and it will going to send an email notification. All right. Okay, what else? Hmm. Um, regarding database, do, can you tell me what is transaction? Uh, transaction you can say uh, if uh, we are executing one command so whatever operation that are going within that command we can consider as a transaction All right um, do, do you know what is um, regarding um, like say cd or some more, more theoretical, theoretical questions uh, what is canary deployment and blue green deployment? Uh, no. Can you tell me what is the difference between authentication and authorization? Yeah, so if you can say authentication is like uh, if one user is going to log in, then it has some additional credential uh, like username and password. With that, it is going to authenticate. And authorization, like once user has been logged in that particular system, it has author authorization for accessing the particular resource. So we can say that. Yeah, thanks. Correct. Uh, 
have you been using uh, J- uh, Java applications, build uh, with Maven or Gradle? Uh, no, no, Java. We use a .NET application. Right. Okay, question about uh, Linux. Uh, if uh, we have some uh, um, uh, program running on Linux, some daemon, and we change need to change configuration, uh, and we wouldn't. Uh, mm, our demon to know about this change. Well, let's say Nginx. What should we do? I think uh, best way is to restart that particular daemon. Then only start and able to know. Uh, okay, but uh, uh, apart from like restart is a full st- stop start. Mm-hmm. How can we do it gracefully? Mm-hmm. No, might be there's some command, but uh, no, don't remember right now. All right. I think I'm running out of questions. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, no, no question. Um, all right. 